So for all the fellows and everything, we're going to do the lateral corpectomy technique this morning. Um, disclosures, maybe a few of those are relevant. Um, <clears throat> so objectives, what's the rationale for lateral corpectomy? We're going to go over this review of lateral retropleural and retroperitoneal access, review of the pertinent anatomy, <clears throat> review disc access, review corpectomy technique, <clears throat> and then a few case presentations. So traditional corpectomy approaches. From the posterior, we've got transperdicular, costotransversectomy, lateral extracavitary, <clears throat> and then anterior, there's open thoracotomy, transdiaphragmatic, um, and endoscopic. So why do we want to go less invasive? So the big shark bite, shark, shark bite trauma uh, to the tissue, devascularization, approach-related nerve damage, <clears throat> the need for dual lumen intubation, chest tubes, pulmonary complications, infection risk, prolonged length of stay, <clears throat> and longer return to normal activity. <clears throat> so why a minimally invasive corpectomy? So we're using traditional surgical goals, conventional instruments and techniques, minimal patient morbidity, procedurally designed and integrated technologies with neuromonitoring access, expandable VBR options, <clears throat> as well as lateral and posterior fixation options. So yeah, when we look at this picture, you know, why do we want to go less invasive? So <clears throat> when we do these surgeries, um, we have to think about structures at risk. You know, that's kind of the, one of the main things about, um, you know, learning new techniques is avoiding the structures at risk. Arguably, the easiest surgeries are just all of, all posterior, right? It's muscle, you can get at it. But as soon as we start going into um, other areas that aren't our own, dealing with blood vessels and bowels and kidneys, I think we need to be aware of what's at risk. <clears throat> and if we take, take a look at an MRI scan and not look just at the, the spine itself and the neural elements, you know, we start to look at the other things that are there, <clears throat> you know, the abdominal aorta, the segmental arteries, the iliac arteries, the iliac veins, the vena cava, the bowel, the kidney. So when we start to do things from a lateral approach, these all become very relevant to us. <clears throat> and when we look at how these things change as we descend down the spine towards, you know, the sacrum, things move around a little bit. When we're up higher, we have diaphragm, we have kidney, um, so this is very scant at this point, um, and you look at the position of the aorta and the vena cava, and then as we get lower, we start to see, you know, the blood vessels start to bifurcate <clears throat> and then go into, you know, the iliac vessels. Um, but, you know, this is something that when we're, you know, planning a case, you need to be aware of all of this beforehand so you can avoid these structures at risk. And some of the big things when we get down lower in the spine <clears throat> is what happens to those iliac vessels. Um, sometimes they'll move down into that little sulcus between the psoas and the body. And if you inadvertently run a cob elevator or another instrument across that disc space or that vertebral body space, um, you could have a potentially life ending vascular injury. <clears throat> so preparedness is what it's all about. Um, at this point in your fellowship, you've also probably done a bunch of laterals. And I know from morning conference, you're getting good at picking out what's a good four or five case and what isn't. <clears throat> we look at the psoas anatomy, picture on the left, that's sort of a normal psoas that we would hope to go through. And then we look at the picture on the right, you know, we see, you know, the psoas is pulled forward. And with that, um, the plexus starts to migrate anteriorly. And then also in these situations, sometimes we start to get the iliac vessel dipping down there again. So, you know, only in the most experienced of hands, you know, should things like this be undertaken. <clears throat> we also have to think about the rotation of the spine. So, you know, if we have significant rotation and we were to come um, from the right hand side on this image, we're going to look at sort of what is that implant trajectory and what sort of, you know, uh, vascular and visceral structures we would be uh, traversing. I mean, here we can just see blood vessels, kidney and so forth. Uh, you know, so this also goes into, you know, the planning phase of things. This is something that I think is often underscored, not enough. 
and that's the blood supply of the cord. So we know that the spinal cord gets its blood supply from two paired posterior spinal arteries and then the anterior spinal artery, which is, you know, supplies, you know, the anterior two thirds of the cord. Um, and we have to think about the origin of the anterior spinal artery. Up top, you know, coming off of the vertebra basilar system, you know, the anterior spinal artery comes into play. And then <laughs> relevant to doing corpectomies is the artery of Adamkiewicz. And, you know, this is really important because, you know, this actually comes in, comes off of a radicular artery and then supplies the cord. And this can uh, pop up anywhere between, you know, T8 and L2. Um, and if you're, you know, going to undertake a corpectomy, um, you should know where that blood vessel comes in so you don't accidentally damage it and cause a spinal stroke. And I've seen that, not personally, but I've seen a case where that happened. <clears throat> and so when we understand we have our aorta, we have a segmental vessel, which goes into the intercostal vessel, and then we have this... Uh, spinal radicular branch that comes in and it makes that classic hairpin that we see on angios. So if I'm going to be doing a corpectomy um, or any type of work in that um, thoracolumbar lumbar region that might require sacrificing a nerve or sacrificing a segmental artery, I'll always study this beforehand uh, just so you know we don't end up stroking out somebody's spinal cord. Next structure at risk is the diaphragm. <clears throat> so when we're working in um, doing these corpectomies, it's going to be in one of three areas. It's, we're either going to be super diaphragmatic and retropleural, subdiaphragmatic and retroperitoneal, or transdiaphragmatic retroperitoneal. <laughs> and so with each one of these approaches, you know, we have to know how to manage the structures at risk and um, mitigate damage to the diaphragm. <clears throat> So we know the diaphragm is a dome-shaped musculotendinous partition between the thoracic and abdominal cavities. The superior surface is covered with parietal pleura and pericardium, and the inferior surface is covered by the diaphragmatic fascia. <laughs> and the diaphragm has multiple attachments. There's the sternal or anterior, there's the costal or lateral, and then the lumbar or posterior. And so we anteriorly, we can see this attaches to the xiphoid. And then we think about the costal attachments. Everywhere we have one of these inferior facing ribs, um, the diaphragm is going to attach to that. <clears throat> and then posteriorly, um, you know, it's going to come down and it's going to attach to the TPs and it's going to form a couple of these arcuate ligaments. Um, the first spans around the quadratus and the second around the psoas. And so when we're coming in through this region, um, you know, we're having to negotiate um, these structures. So with the thoracic approach, <clears throat> um, there's transpleural and retropleural. Um, and by all means possible, when I can, I try to go retropleural. Um, and we know that that pleural space, there's a couple planes, right? There's the parietal pleura, right, which is the <clears throat> outer pleural attachment to the chest wall, and then there's a visceral pleura, and then that pleural cavity is this space in between, and our goal is to be able to dissect this parietal pleura off from the chest wall <clears throat> uh, so we can stay out of the chest and avoid having to do things like a chest tube. So let's go back to vascular anatomy in the chest cavity. <clears throat> um, you know, whenever we're going to do something, I don't care if it's a, a, a spinal deformity, a scoli case, um, it's always good to know where the aorta is because it moves around the chest <clears throat> and it can become very ectatic in people. So sometimes that aorta can actually be right up under the rib cage. Um, so I always pay particular attention when I'm planning my cases as to the position um, of the aorta. I'm going to put my laser up here so we can see that. <clears throat> Um, and then also the vena cava on the other side, right? And what's this doing? So there, there's a lot going on, and this is at the, the thoracal lumbar junction, and we can just see how busy this is <clears throat> with vascular and neural structures. So on the right side of the chest wall, um, we have even more interesting things. So we have the azygous vein, and basically that's going to drain sort of the right-sided upper abdominal cavity. Um, and at every level, 
you know, we have one of the segmental veins coming into it. <clears throat> we also have the sympathetic trunk and the splanchnic nerve coming off from here. And so, you know, if you're planning a right-sided approach, make sure you review, you know, the relevant anatomy <clears throat> and have that phone a friend card uh, handy in case you get into something and you need one of your thoracic colleagues around to help um, repair or avoid damage to something. So coming right underneath the nerve, <clears throat> we have the neurovascular bundle. So we can see it lives in this little divot here. <clears throat> There's a, a vein, an artery, and a nerve. Um, and when we're, when or if we're removing ribs, know they're there and get after them before they get after you. <clears throat> so let's go to the TL junction. You know, the vast majority of corpectomies that we do, particularly for trauma, uh, occur in the TL junction. And so we're going to have to know how to, you know, manage these and what we're going to run into. So the TL junction, um, we can be above the diaphragm um, to get access to the pleural space. Um, between the ribs, if you're just doing a discectomy and if you're doing a corpectomy, <clears throat> we have to be able to do rib resection um, to get after this. Um, there's definitely some techniques for getting in here um, and doing the transdiaphragmatic retroperitoneal approach. So now we're stepping down a little bit. So outside of the chest wall um, and this kind of, there's a few pearls that I've kind of um, developed over the years and it's kind of using um, my finger in the retroperitoneal space. So I'll make an access incision. Um, <clears throat> and then what I'll do is I'll actually lift the diaphragm up, you know, cranially um, I'll release it, you know, from its attachments and it allows me to work directly in the subdiaphragmatic space because um, we have to think about sort of that uh, costophrenic angle and how the diaphragm uh, dips down. So <clears throat> I, I just tried to play this this morning and my video is not playing, um, but there's a technique if we remove the overlying ribs and we have a finger in the retroperitoneal space, you can actually trap the diaphragm and feel as it courses in that dome shape. Um, and you can, like I said, you can open up that retroperitoneal space and reflect uh, the diaphragm up. I'm gonna, I think I just got a web meeting something. I'm gonna get rid of that. Is that coming up on the screen? No, it's gone, okay. Um, another thing that you can leverage are sort of the angled instruments. So, you know, to effectively work beneath the rib cage, we can use the angled instruments. They have about a 20 degree um, tilt on them. So sometimes, you know, you maybe take off the 11th or the 12th, depending how it is. Um, and then it'll also allow you to stay out of the chest cavity. So <clears throat> I think this one doesn't play either. Um, but this is like a transillumination of the chest cavity. And so, you know, we can see that, you know, this is that costophrenic angle. Again, so this dips down. So usually in the upper lumbar area, even um, if we're doing just a lateral discectomy, um, these structures are there. So knowing their presence and knowing how to manage them is definitely critical. Um, this video also didn't play this morning for whatever reason, so. Um, maybe it will play. Nope, it's not going to play. <clears throat> That's okay. <clears throat> and now let's see if this one's going to play. No, this isn't. So this is actually, um, again, head to the right, foot to the left, and this is a rib that's been resected. And so this is the diaphragm. And so this is after you've done that, you're able to kind of go in through that space with the diaphragm and reflect that diaphragm cranially and get access to the uh, retroperitone retroperitoneal space. So <clears throat> when I'm doing these cases, um, either in the upper lumbar or lower thoracic, what I'll do is when I have the patient up in the lateral position, I'll mark out, you know, the disc space above the disc base below, I'll mark out the anterior and the posterior lines, and then I'll sort of trap between my fingers whatever rib is most crossing over the vertebral body. 
Um, and that's the incision I'll make. I'll make it just in that plane along the rib. So getting into this, <clears throat> um, I'll make my incision and, and I might make this actually a little bit longer than you would for a typical lateral. And what I'll do is I'll use, you know, the Alexander or the Doyen, or I like to use uh, one Penfield. And what I'll do is I'll get a really good subperiosteal dissection on the rib, and then I'll work beneath the rib. And this is usually where if you get carried away, you end up getting into the uh, chest cavity. So I'll take extra time here and develop that plane. Um, I'll get, you know, the, the spatula end of the one pen field under there help to open it up because it's blunt, not cutting like the doyen. <clears throat> and then I'll get my finger up in there. And I'll also trace the rib back posteriorly. So I want to make sure that, you know, I'm as far back as I possibly can get and as far anterior as I possibly get. And then at that point, <clears throat> um, I'll section the nerve. And let's see, this one doesn't play either. Awesome. <clears throat> um, so if you're in the retropleural plane, um, this is a little bit trickier because um, what you want to do is be able to get that parietal pleura pulled off the chest cavity. And so once you remove the rib, um, you can very gently with your finger start to sweep it uh, cranially and caudally and develop that plane. Um, and then once you get a little bit further down uh, posteriorly, you can use a sponge stick and just be, you know, super cautious with your technique because, again, you don't want to end up violating the visceral pleura if, if at all possible. <clears throat> and then once you get down there, um, you know, this video actually plays. You're able to see kind of nicely. we can separate those structures out. Okay, <clears throat> so when we get down here, um, the first thing we're gonna do is get our initial dilator docked. Um, we'll get a lateral image to confirm that we're approximately centered over the vertebral body and parallel to the discs. Um, and we should also make sure the dilator is flush with the vertebra on the um, AP image. <clears throat> Let's see, is this guy going to play? No, this one's not going to play. Okay. Some, some video issues today. <clears throat> um, and then in terms of like what you do with your retractor, um, there's a couple different things you can do. Some of the retractors have this sort of fan type blade that you can put anteriorly to keep the lung, lung from creeping in. Um, alternatively, you could flip the retractor around the other way and just use the posterior blade to keep all this out of the way. <clears throat> um, because one other thing that we will typically have to do in the chest cavity is resect the rib head. So I guess the other pearl here is with um, this type blade, um, I'll make the posterior blade shorter than the two side blades just so you can ride up the rib cage. So if, say if these are 140s, I'll make this a 130, just so you can get after that rib head if you need to. Um, the next thing we need to do is identify our segmental. Um, sometimes it's not so obvious, other times it is. Um, and I'll get after that and cauterize this um, right from the get go. And I would just say, be really careful um, cauterizing at the anterior vertebral line um, I'm sure you've all experienced it as of now. You start buzzing something, and if it's close to the parent vessel that it comes off from, um, now you can have this big gaping hole, um, and it's close to the parent vessel, and then it's really tough to get that thing uh, taken care of. So if you section it sort of in the middle, and if you need to put uh, a vascular clip on it, you can, and then just push it and sweep it out of your way. Um, <clears throat> then in the chest, um, you'll get after the discs, you'll start to do your discectomies. And so I think the other pearl with this is it's not just trying to do like a real quick discectomy. Um, while you're in the disc base, I think you want to make sure you're cleaning out front to back as much as possible. You want to use, you know, the ring curettes, the stirrups and so forth to really get the vertebral end plates cleaned off. 
because when you're trying to put your implant in later in the case, you know, when there's, you know, more bleeding going on, obviously, um, you know, the more disc that's in the way, um, the harder it's going to get this implant to sit where you want it to. So I'll take a lot of extra time here, use the upgoing curettes. Uh, sometimes I'll use kerosin to make sure that, you know, I remove the annulus on the other side just so I can get um, that cage to sit where I want it to. <clears throat> okay. Then when we get into doing our corpectomy, um, depends what we're doing it for, whether it's trauma or tumor or so forth, you'll use different sort of approaches. Um, but if we're going to be using chisels to cut into the body, um, I propose this. We start anteriorly. I'm going to put my laser pointer back up here. So if you start anteriorly, um, you know, you're not going to have a free floating fragment as if you came posteriorly. So, you know, we start anteriorly, we'll make a cut through the disc space, but being mindful not to get into, you know, the paradjacent vertebral body. Um, and then we'll match it on the lower end here. So the upper, lower, whichever. And then we're going to come posterior when we're going to do this. And then just also take into account like the depth in which you are um, using the chisel, right? So the vertebral bodies are, you know, not a rectangle, more diamond shape or what have you. And so I think a good safeguard is to stop when you get to the level of the pedicle so you don't accidentally, you know, take a sharp instrument and cross through the vertebral body into the chest cavity on the other side. <clears throat> so um, be mindful of that. Um, next, once you get those cuts done, um, you can use sort of double action rondures and you can oftentimes pull that piece of vertebral body out, um, almost like a, a dresser drawer, it'll slide out and you can get it out. Um, word of caution though, the segmental on the other side of the chest cavity is also there and it likes to bleed. Um, so just be prepared, you know, when you're removing this other posterior wall, if that's your intent, um, <clears throat> that, you know, you've got all these chest, um, vessels and so forth over there, you need to, uh, contend with. Um, if you have bone that's in the canal, there's a couple different ways to address it. Sometimes just through ligament ataxis, um, as you put the, you know, implant in and expand it, that'll help, um, pull those fragments back in. <clears throat> um, but if you need to directly decompress it, usually what I'll do is I'll move around to the abdominal side of the patient. And that way I'll have line of sight looking into the canal. And you can use, um, you know, curettes or pituitaries or what have you to kind of pull those fragments out. <clears throat> I would say use caution. Um, it's traumatic or tumor, there's engorged epidurals there and they like to bleed. And in the trauma setting, just be really thoughtful about ventral dural tears. Sometimes just from the traumatic event, there can be a dural tear. And then trying to repair this is really challenging. Um, just because of the, the working length and channel that you're in, <clears throat> not having um, direct line of sight to it. So just be really mindful about that. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. So <clears throat> in terms of sizing the implants, um, even before I take the vertebral body out, I'll size the end caps. So I'll figure out what is, what's going to be the appropriate size end cap for this patient. <clears throat> I like to use rectangular implants uh, as opposed to the circular ones. We get better end plate engagement. You're crossing the ring um, and I think greater stability. So I'll have this pre-planned out which end caps I'm going to use after I've done my discectomies <clears throat> and then we'll measure the core. So there's a couple different sizes. You can have, you know, 16 or or 20 millimeter cores um, and so i'll make sure that i know which size core i'm going to use i always try to go with the biggest one possible and then we'll use calipers to measure um, the height <clears throat> that we're going to try to span so when we put this in um, i like to put it in as nearly expanded as possible um, this allows you to do two things. Number one, you can pack the graft beforehand into, you know, the aperture of the corpectomy cage. 
so you're not like having it fully collapse. You have it nearly expanded so you can get it in without, you know, having to go um, too crazy with malleting. <clears throat> and then once you get it in and you're seated in a good position on your fluoro, you know, you have the main strut of this in alignment where you want it, you feel like you have good end plate engagement, then you can start to expand it. Uh, word of caution though, the expansion devices on these is really powerful and you could easily um, over distract. Uh, so as you're doing this, um, there's some kind of tactile feedback you're using, visually you're looking on the fluoro, um, but just don't keep going to town. You're not trying to change a flat tire on your car. So uh, definitely don't over distract. <clears throat> and then in terms of, you know, locking this, most of these devices have a final tightener set screw, which you can lock off. And then, you know, you also have to think about, or, you know, what are your other fixation techniques? Are you going to use a lateral plate? Or are you going to use posterior fixation? <clears throat> um, when we're in the retroperitoneal space, um, what I usually do is I don't dock mid-body on that vertebra because now we're dealing with plexus, right? So I'll do the disc above, the disc below, and then get after the corpectomy. Um, and I think you guys know at this point in the year is we're kind of coming in this space. We've got these superficial nerves, the ili ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric. Um, so these guys are going to be there, lateral femoral cutaneous <clears throat> down below. And so as we're doing these retro peritoneal incisions, um, don't be blowing through here with the cautery. Use your typical uh, lateral dissection techniques. <clears throat> okay. Um, here we're dealing with the lumbar plexus. So that's our structure at risk here. And we know that lives in the posterior third of the disc space. And so we'll use, uh, you know, very mindful neuromonitoring monitoring to get in there and we'll access a disc, a disc, and then the vertebral body. Um, you guys have been uh, exposed to this so far in the year, you know, getting in there. I'd like to do still a two incision technique. Um, really helps me get in to find the place, separate things, push, you know, either the ascending or descending colon forward and get it out of my way. Also, it helps me with the kidney. <clears throat> um, we won't really do the monitoring. I think you guys know about that. Um, once we're docked, um, I'm, again, very judicious about my discectomy, making sure I clean out as much as I can. Um, I'm also very expeditious about getting in and clean out the disc spaces. I have sort of a time metric in my head, which I try to achieve for each level. Uh, we know that plexus um, injury is directly correlated with retractor time. So even in the corpectomy setting, if you're very expeditious, <clears throat> you can get in and out. So lumbar dilation, we're gonna get in here, we're gonna dock, we're gonna release the disc from the end plates, we're gonna clean everything up. I'm gonna kinda brisk, breeze through this real quick and we'll kinda get into the cases. You guys have already had lateral talks and have done laterals. Um, so not to just to dice this up in terms of, you know, a T-lip score or anything like that. <clears throat> this was, you know, a traumatic case. It was a three column injury. Um, so a higher grade burst fracture. And so with this case, um, I elected to frame it out first. So perk it posteriorly, which I kind of like to do, you know, when you put patients onto, you know, the hall frame, they kind of fall into anatomical position. And so this was one that I had, I had perked initially, and then I came in to do the corpectomy. Um, and this is actually the chisel technique. So let's see, so I'm in here, and now I'm, as you watch, see? So as I'm putting this down, I'm going one end plate first, then I'm the other end plate, because the chisel isn't big enough to span the whole vertebral body. And I'll take frequent pictures here, because what I want to avoid is getting into the vertebral body above or below, <clears throat> which has happened and it's not fun to try to fix that. Um, and so here's the implant going in. And again, as it's going in, it's in a near fully expanded state. Um, and I'll make sure that, you know, this thing is in alignment with the uh, spinous processes. And then here it is in the lateral position. <clears throat> and that was the final thing. You also can select end caps, right? So what is the proper end, end cap? How much 
lordosis are you going to put into it? Is it going to be parallel? And I'll typically try to do that beforehand, <clears throat> just so it's less math when the patient's open and the patient's bleeding. Um, and there was the post-op on this patient. So look good. Um, so metastatic disease, this is an, another powerful tool for doing these MIS. This was uh, a gal, 48, with an isolated breast met, <clears throat> you know, destruction of her L3 vertebral body. Um, you can get at this a lot of different ways. I elected to do it um, percutaneous. I went in and perked her above and below. I did cement augmentation. Uh, she had some tumor blush here and here. Um, and when I had her doing the perk portion first, I also distracted on this side to straighten that out. And then on the second portion of the case, <clears throat> I did the corpectomy. So here's kind of the after stage one, and then stage two coming in here, um, putting the implant in and a good M play engagement. So that was, uh, I think, a really good fit on her. And you can see we're running front to back, front to back for the whole body. So <clears throat> fun case. And so this was her before, um, and that's that afterwards. Uh, again, before, <clears throat> after. So nice um, result on her. This was a guy who hit the Dave and Busters off the eight. Um, he got forced off the, the overpass there, and that's his truck. Um, so this guy also had a uh, you know, devastating uh, injury. He only had minimum leg weakness, but you can see he's got a big um, chunk of that posterior vertebra into his canal. Um, so I think on this guy, what I did initially was I came and I perked him, and I actually did a direct decompression in the back, but through a small fascial incision. Um, he also had um, some damage to his L3 vertebra. And so what I did is I went and I cement augmented this and I would use uh, ProDense by right medical technology. So it's a resorbable bone paste. <clears throat> um, and that was him afterwards. So I got him back into alignment and I was able to actually physically come in and remove those fragments from the canal. So this was one Mundus and I did ages ago. So this was a guy who had a post-infectious kyphosis, um, <clears throat> pretty bad deformity here. And I think round one, try to do this posterior procedure and put one of these smaller <clears throat> implants in. It didn't have good end plate engagement. And soon after surgery, that had subsided and he broke his rods and he was bent back over again. <laughs> and so this was a case where um, came in laterally and did a two level corpectomy. Um, so where, you know, this had kind of um, subsided into both of those bones. Um, we removed both of those. I don't remember if Greg did this part with me or not. We might have done the first part together, but. Um, it looked too and, good. I probably wasn't there. <clears throat> Yeah, you'd remember this guy. He was the guy that had the laryngectomy. Oh, I know. I, I remember him. <laughs> you remember him. So do I. <clears throat> that was back in the, maybe the Alley Boggery days. Maybe. Yeah. I think it was, if Alley's on the phone. Again, so, yeah, that so, looks too good. That looks too good for me, too. <clears throat> yeah, maybe I didn't do this. Maybe we sent him out. Maybe Bob did this. No, I did this one. <clears throat> yeah. And so got a kind of a good result on him with good end plate engagement. <clears throat> and then I, I continued to see him and I remember seeing him for his two year thing and the guy was going to the gym and everything. So that was a, a good application for that. So I think in summary, um, you got to know your anatomy. I think anytime we're poking around the chest or abdominal cavity, um, you got to know your structures at risk. And, you know, you have to think about the position of the lung, the bowel, the kidney, the plexus, the vessels. It's a whole different heightened level of awareness than just doing posterior cases. Um, the next thing is um, just don't rush through when you're doing um, your discectomy. Like really clean the annulus off the um, end plates. So when you go to put your implant in, you know, it's going to sit where you want it to. Um, and that's why I'll, I'll trial, I'll use that end plate trial before just to make sure that, you know, I've got it cleaned up and it's going to go where I want. 
Um, plan your end plate angles before. <clears throat> Make sure your rep has this, you know, so, you know, you're not fidgeting around after you've got like a big exposure done trying to put this together. The closer you can approximate, you know, the end caps you want and the size of the implant you want, um, they can get it ready as you're doing your work. And then I think the other big thing is just don't over distract. Um, again, these devices are really powerful. Um, and, you know, if you just start cranking on that, you know, you could actually probably cause a vascular injury, I would imagine, you know, because you're just distracting a neural injury because you're distracting. So just be cautious with that. <clears throat> and that's what I got to say about that. And I'm going to go back over to this screen and stop sharing. Okay. Uh, hey, I have a question. This is Mike. Um, that was a great lecture. Thank you for that. Uh, what do you do for post-op rehab? Do you change from a normal, like, uh, fusion protocol? A normal what protocol? Like, from any of your other fusions, like an A-lift or a lateral, or are you kind of keeping them on the same pace? Yeah, I try to. I think these implants are so robust. <clears throat> um, I might keep them in a brace a little bit longer. Maybe, you know, apart from just like a one or two level degenerative case, I'll keep them in a brace probably for a full 12 weeks, um, you know, and then I'll follow them. And, you know, years ago, I, I never thought these would fuse through there, but there was one little lady that we did <clears throat> a surgery on that we got a CT for another reason, like two years out, and she had a solid column of bone going through her corpectomy cage. So they can heal and they do, um, <clears throat> but... I think that's it, probably just prolonged bracing. That was a great talk, Don, thank you. Um, you know, we don't, I feel like we don't do as many of these as we used to. Um, I don't know if your practice has had that experience with it at all, um, but I think it's in part probably, you know, what you're seeing in the clinic and the office and on call, et cetera. So, but it's a great, great tool to have in your back pocket. Um, the other thing I think is interesting, even in the lumbar spine, and maybe it's like location, because typically we're doing these at L2 or higher, um, occasionally below it. But like, I have, I feel like most patients don't really have too many neurologic issues with splitting the psoas that much and working through it. And I wonder if it's like the traumatic event that, you know, like prepares the space for you to go in there laterally, but you know, paranoid we are doing one and two level laterals. It's like when you do a corpectomy, it takes way longer, right? You're not sticking to the 20 minute rule. You're taking your time to get the bone out and the canal decompressed and et cetera, et cetera. And then the patients tend to wake up. Okay. So. Yeah. I'm always startled but, by that, right? You're like, yeah. wow, we just punched like, a massive hole in your psoas and you know took out a well, whole bone and you know i i split I haven't the fibers, had one person right? with a neural deficit from that which is kind yeah. of impressive yeah, I yeah think I, if you did a lot of l4 corpectomies you might have different results though you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> that's a different animal than <clears throat> than than higher up that's right. true yeah. and yeah you know it's like interesting i'm not doing trauma anymore so, I mean, other than a rare tumor, which I think that whole tumor game has changed as well, you know, I'm not doing the volume of these lateral corpectomies I used to. Yeah, I think speaking to the neurologic injury deficit, you know, lack of those, I still think we use really good technique. I mean, I still think we're working the disc space, working the disc space. I think that we're giving that whole thing some breaks. We're just using the same techniques we always do, and I think those have been effective even for our one and two level laterals, I mean, because we're using the same technique. That's my yeah. gestalt. Exactly. And I think at least, you know, those of us on, on this meeting, um, we've reached that sort of higher level of crowning of doing lateral surgeries. I mean, we've probably all done over a thousand at this point in our careers and, you know, you really got your game tightened up. So stepping up to the next level and doing a corpectomy you know, when you have that kind of experience, you know, it just kind of follows through. Awesome. Thanks, Don. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank Ellie you, Bonner, Don. Thank I you. appreciate it, Don.
Ali, you remember that guy, right? I do remember him. Yeah, that was a that was a fun one. I do remember that one. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great Monday. We'll see you. Thanks.